Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. Hello there. Sorry we missed you last week. I was up peeping the fall colors in Wisconsin or in town and doing hours and hours of portfolio work. Take your pick. Draw your own picture. Uh, anyway, we're back with this fun episode talking to John Robinson, who I knew from way back when, uh, when he had a bit more hair and ran his own CTA program. He's since graduated out of the sordid commodity space into a bona fide investment advisor now, and we dig into what that unique perspective, having been on both sides of the game, getting allocated to and choosing whom to allocate to, uh, plus what it's like educating clients these days and how he thinks about trend-following asset allocation decisions and exposures something I dabble in personally. Send it. This episode is brought to you by RCM's Clearing and Execution Group, which helps ETFs like the ones John Group mentions and invests in efficiently access and trade exchange traded futures and derivatives markets. Visit rcmalts.com to learn more. Now back to the show. All right, we're here with John. John, how are you? Hey, Jeff, I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, so we got to give the listeners a quick little background that we used to know each other. We were just trying to off off camera decide whether it was 10, 20, some, somewhere in between 10 and 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking 10 to 15 years ago. I mean, you kindly identified that back then I had hair. <laughs> really nice of you um you look good without the hair you, you yeah. wear it well yeah thank you thanks it's, uh, i have no choice so I, I sort of have to do that and where in the world are you you're still down in uh southeast somewhere yep uh, north carolina greensboro is is blueprints uh hq perfect greensboro and that's grown probably as much as you've lost hair that's grown an equivalent amount right that whole carolina's area it's, in the last it's a, 20 it, it's a one correlation yeah um, and what is all that just general industry or specific industries? Yeah, I mean, it's, I would say more general. I mean, we've had a lot of companies, we haven't had it in North Carolina as much as Texas and Florida have, but there's been a pretty large migration to the, to the South, Southeast and a lot of company headquarters, uh, Honda jets has moved into to Greensboro and manufactures jets from here. So that added you know, a lot to the local economy. Um, it certainly helped um, bolster real estate prices. Yeah. Uh, Toyota's building a battery factory here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's grown, but not too much, which is why I like it. And who's your who's your college team in Greensboro? You're sort of a little west of all that, of Tobacco Road, right? Yeah, we're a little west. Um I mean, I pull for Carolina. I went to UNC Greensboro, but I, I grew mm. up a, a Tar Heel fan, so I, I still maintain that allegiance. There you go. They're pretty good this year, right? In football, that quarterback might get drafted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, May uh, is the quarterback. They're pretty good. I mean, Mac Brown coached in the in the 90s, right, in early 2000s, left for a long time. He went to Texas, went to um, ESPN, and then he came back as coach, and he's rejuvenated the program to the extent it needed to be rejuvenated he's right he's, what was he 80 he's got to be up there he's definitely up there yeah and then i gotta ask because i can just barely read it with my rapidly decreasing vision uh behind you man in the arena what is, what does it say yeah so man in the arena is a is a basically a, a quote from a teddy roosevelt speech my wife gave me that and uh to be honest with you, I didn't intentionally put it in the way of the camera. It just so happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's in that room. That it's it's there, but I do like the message. And I don't know if, right, that's been a little co-opted by uh, Chamath, who did all the scam uh, SPACs and whatnot. And he was saying, hey, leave me alone. I know I lost you billions of dollars, but I'm in the arena. I'm doing it. But I think I like Teddy's Roosevelt's version better. Yeah, I, I think I do, too. And uh I think we've seen a lot in the past five years, how many things can actually get co-opted. Yeah, <laughs> that's for damn sure. Moving on, we touched on a little bit, but so you're in a previous life, 
uh, Blueprint now, you're an RA, but in a previous life, you were a CTA, which is near and dear to our hearts. So tell us, uh, you can start even before that, how you kind of became, when you were young, got through college, first started out in the business world, became a CTA. Give us a little quick backstory there. Sure, yeah. Well, you know, I am from the South, so giving a quick backstory <laughs> for me. Quick for, um, quick for a Southerner, yeah. Yeah, quick for a Southerner. I'll, I'll do my best. So yeah, when I graduated college in 2003, I started working for Bear Stearns um, in their floor trading operations on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so we it was a subsidiary, Bear Wagner, and I basically, you know, two weeks after I graduated, started work there um, as a market maker. When I did that for, you know, a tour of duty there. And, you know, my thinking was, okay, I want to be a portfolio manager. So I want to try to get as much experience, you know, I want to, as well-rounded an experience as I can. So I left the floor and got into equity research, um, covering infrastructure software for Prudential Equity Group, which is, you know, going from a sprint to a marathon. And that really doesn't even cover half of it, you know, yeah, nine, nine to four on the floor, and you really don't take anything except some emotional wounds home. And then, you know, equity research, you're sleeping under your desk. So it was very different. Um, but along the way, uh, Brandon Langley, who's one of the co-founders of Blueprint and is the Langley and Robinson Langley, he and I met in college and we were doing trading and, and started to get into system design uh, for a lot of reasons, but mainly because, you know, I in equity research started to see the disconnect between fundamental analysis and actual stock prices. So I just started to ask the the question of, okay, why? Yeah. You know, what, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, first of all, why is the market ignoring what we're saying that uh, the, the, where the stock price should be, what are the drivers behind that? And probably more importantly, what are the most successful investors in the world doing? So uh, probably as a lot of stories go, I ended up uh, stumbling upon market wizards mm. and a lot of Jack Schwager's writing. And I uh, was really, I see it as, uh, you know, a Damascus Road type moment where the scales fell off my eyes and, you know, I can sort of see clearly. And uh, for me, it was the, the things I started to see clearly were uh, being systematic uh, and employing a trend following process, really ignoring the fundamentals or just in assuming that they're baked in and following price. So we started designing, specifically designing trend following systems. And then in 2006, I moved back to North Carolina and we started Robinson Langley, which was a CTA. Um, now, you know, as the story goes and evolves and we being trend followers, trading, you know, every market that we could, you know, we had no Rolodex at all. Um, I don't even know if people say that anymore, Rolodex. Yeah, you know? I do. I tell people, they're like, should I start a fund? I'm like, if you have a golden Rolodex, yes, start a fund. You can call people. And if you don't, you got to go the managed account route and go through brokers and, and talk to people and try and get accounts. Yeah, exactly. So we, we did both, but we did start um, a fund. And we started it with 60,000 under management day one. Ooh, ooh. And you know, you, know, you know, as well as anybody, when you're trying to trade a lot of markets, that leaves you with two choices. Don't trade a lot of markets or do it with a lot of leverage. And I'm convinced we could not do that today. Um, yeah. But, you know, just with compliance costs where they are, you know, all the hard costs are, are 10x what they were. But, um, you know, we started with 60,000 day one. Um, and we had a great 07 because I you know, believe that's the first time oil went above 100. And if you're doing it with a lot of leverage like we were then, um, it kind of doesn't matter where you buy oil as long as you buy it and ride it, ride it up. So we had a great 07. And then we had an even better 08 because, again, dutiful trend followers, a lot of leverage, you know, we're long and short the right things. But back in that 07, 08 period, there weren't a lot of great 40 act options for accessing managed futures. So a few uh, RIAs came to us and said, hey, look, we want this exposure, but we don't like what we see in the public arena. What if we start our own limited partnership, you run it and we split the fees, 
which again, I'm not even sure you could do today with yeah. uh, pre-08 generated compliance. Um, so we did that. And after 08, you know, two of these firms came to us and said, look, you're the only thing that made money in the portfolio, but we're only putting qualified investors in this fund. So that's like 5% of 5% of their yeah. assets. It's not worth their time. And not to mention you're in the wild west of futures. And it's really hard to explain to our clients what it is that you're doing and why they can't keep their money at Schwab. Right. right. We're, we're spending, we used to say we're spending 30% of our time explaining something that's going to be 5% of the portfolio. That's bad math for an RA. Exactly. Yeah. So they were upside Pareto principle, you know, it was just up, yeah. they were upside down. And, but they said, look, if you can domesticate what you're doing uh, to things that people actually hold in, in a Schwab or TD or Fidelity account, and you can prove that to us. Then, and, and largely keep your principles and, and the fundamentals by which you're managing the assets the same, um, we would consider outsourcing our whole book to you. And then as an IA and a planner, you know, we'll go do the things that we're good at and that actually make us money like prospecting and serving clients. So for us, that was somewhat of a godfather offer uh, at the time because in the space we were operating in, in futures, it still seemed like it was day over day performance driven. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody was putting a managed account with us uh, and let's say they wanted, you know, they were notionalizing it, you know, three or four X in some cases, uh, daily performance really mattered to them. And it didn't matter as much to us. It only mattered to us to the extent it mattered to them. Right. Like we're thinking 10, 20 years. years and they're thinking 10, 20 minutes. So we started developing those systems in 09. And after about 18 months of, you know, just making the R&D process, which it really isn't that thick, but just making sure we were taking into account the, the practical realities of managing client assets for an RIA, we started managing those assets on a white label basis. So we're managing, we're, we're executing, we're doing all the reporting and they're just putting their brand on top. And then demand for what we were doing in that respect kept, continued to grow. Uh, and so we started Blueprint in 13 to take advantage of those uh, opportunities we, we were getting. And we made the original relationships, sub-advisory relationships, and they still are today. Perfect. The, um, a few background questions. So what did you study in college that led you down that systematic path? Were you an engineer or something like that, or it just made sense to you? Well, it, it made sense to me. I studied, um, I got a degree in finance and I got a degree in economics and I largely credit Brandon with the economics degree because I sat beside of him and he studied and I didn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'd always had an interest in markets. Um, you know, my family is um, very entrepreneurial, you know, not to some no one's gone public, but they've always run their own businesses. So I was attracted. I saw that and just thought it was normal, you yeah. know? And um, so I always knew, at least I thought I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, the market interest sort of evolved over time. And then, you know, Ed Sakota has this thing about, you know, finding a system that you're emotionally compatible with. And so when I found systematic and something that was rules based and really, you know, once once you have the rules and they, you know, they evolve over time as well, really the discipline to stick with the process over time, that that resonated with me the most. The um, and then an interesting time to go into equity research and to be right. You went to the place that was almost anti entrepreneur, right? Big Wall Street bank. But at the same time, that was oh threes right after dot com and all the research had been faked essentially, right? To to make sure the uh, IPOs got a good reaction. And so were you right in the midst of that of like, hey, you this research has to be real. Right? Yeah. With all the Chinese walls and all that stuff of like research is separate. Yes, yes. Uh a hundred percent. Yeah, that was um I think WorldCom had 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 just gone down. Um, you know, Enron of you know was of course propped up. Uh, by some some analysts as well. So yeah, that was right after dot com and right before we found out that the bond rating agencies were doing the same thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, right for mortgages. 
And then, was that hard to be like, okay, this is my job, but my passion is systematic, right? Because the equity research is totally 180 degrees opposite of systematic. Yeah. You could care less what the fundamental research says. It's either I'm buying because it made new highs, I'm selling because it made new lows. Well, I was the guy that carried around, um, well, maybe I was the nerd that carried <laughs> around, you know, the intelligent investor. Yeah. A lot of value books. And, you know, I still, Buffett and Munger are still some of my investing heroes. You know, I just, I love the the rationality. Any discussion around rationality is, is one I typically enjoy. Uh, but the, 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 the switch for me was pretty easy, honestly. Uh, I mean, look, I had to become an entrepreneur because I'm the world's worst employee. (laughs) That, that was not, uh, that was easy. Um, and then once I, I was skeptical of the, of the data that I was seeing between, you know, mostly anecdotal evidence on the fundamental side and then, you know, hard evidence on the systematic side. So once I started getting into that and validating some of the data and also looking at the track records of a lot of systematic managers, thanks to Michael Covell and and his work and, and his research, um, at the beginning, it, it wasn't hard for me to migrate over, you know, to the dark side, so to speak. Right. Which is, which is technically on this podcast, the light side, right? The light side, there the, you go. The, those equity guys are the dark side. So then started blueprint with uh, Brandon and said, Hey, let's take this to the masses with this, public facing equity. So dig into that a little bit more. It was a little confusing of you're putting your trend following models on top of things they could trade in their Schwab account. So that was like sector ETFs or what, what, what did that look like? Yeah. Mainly at the beginning, it was a lot of sector ETFs. Again, that's, that's a, those portfolios have evolved as well. Um, we still at the very, very beginning of, of managing, let's say assets at Schwab, for somebody's, you know, Roth or, you know, one of their uh, more mainstream accounts, we still had our CTA hats on when we first started. So we had commodity ETFs. We had, you know, and it was a portfolio of 40 different ETFs. Um, And we would use inverse exposure, you know, when we would get a short signal in, in stocks. And that was a painful lesson for us to learn. And I'm not saying that, you know, if people choose to do that, that they're doing the wrong thing. I'm just saying for us, what we realized was that how much behavior, investor behavior really mattered for the end client. Hmm. And so what we really focused on from, from the get-go at Blueprint is trying to trying to make and preserve and enhance the relationship between the advisor and their client because as as an asset manager you know we see our the the advisor and the client are the star of the show and we are infrastructure to help them get to where they want to go to and that's either the advisor's business and or where the client wants to get to from a goal perspective so we don't have any, you know, preconceived notions or hubris about, you know, we're the star because they can pick any asset manager. They don't have to pick Blueprint. Nobody has to pick Blueprint. Right. So we wanted to win more on the basis of, okay, let's let's design systems and therefore deliver strategies that keep the investors in their seats during the hard times. And for us, that means avoiding those periods where their bad behavior is likely to show up the most, and that's in large drawdowns. You you stole my question I had written down here. How much of your job is picking out great investments versus how much is just trying to keep the investors disciplined? So yeah, you just answered it, right? It's 90% keeping them disciplined. But to do that, you need the other piece, which is the, the great investments that allow you to do that. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And we... In our portfolios, we don't really use anything that's um, esoteric. You know, we try to keep it, the portfolio simple. Um, We try to keep it pretty commonsensical. 
by thinking about that interaction between the advisor and the client. So what what is, you know, it's like uh, using the inversion principle. We don't say, you know, what could enhance that relationship? We say what could kill that relationship, mm. right? And tough conversations about costs, tough conversations about taxes, about turnover, um, you know, all those things make for a tough conversation for the advisor and the client. So we try to design things to just avoid those. And so did what did that look like over time? So it was initially you had your CTA hat on a little bit and maybe you were having a lot of those tough conversations of why are we in this high cost inverse ETF that has lost 90% over time, right? <laughs> I, I remember a blog post I did of the, I think it was 2X net gas ETF and the inverse minus 2X net gas ETF. They had both lost 94, 96% over time. Right. They were it, they were supposed to be the exact opposite thing, but because of the rebalancing and leverage, right, they were killing themselves with the leverage cost. Um, so all that to say, so you were you had that CTA hat on, you had all those commodity focused. So compare and contrast what that was like then versus five years later versus now. Yeah. So the the tough conversations we were having then were what we realized is the how short an investor's memory is relative on a relative performance basis. So I guess what I mean is specifically in 2011, uh, that was, I believe, the first debt ceiling, you know, or, or in recent memory, that was the in the gov almost the government almost shut down. It was that whole debate that they seem to have in, in every four to yeah. years perpetually. Um so we the, the trend following models that we were employing had us scaling out of equities, let's say June, July uh, of 11. And using inverse, you know, we got net short some of those in some accounts, um, which was fantastic because the S&P had a 19% drawdown roughly, you know, during that period of time. Yeah, heroes. That's what we thought, right? Yeah. And, you know, when you're not getting any calls, you're probably doing okay as a as a money manager. So uh, no one was calling. But then you see this bounce, which inevitably happens, and uh, there's a the lag. You know, we have to before we cover the short or or increase exposure, the trend following models have to catch up. So we didn't end up. You know, the S and P closes. Uh, I think down a little bit for the year calendar year of 11. And we're basically, our performance was about right with it because of the big bounce back in November, December, but we did so with far less risk. So we thought, Hey, this is great. But the only feedback we got from advisors and clients at the time was why didn't you re re-engage stocks earlier? And, you know, why is it taking this long to, like we missed out on the run from mid October forward without paying attention to the the yeah bypassing of a lot of downside risk. So you know after we sort of let our egos get caught up in that feedback that we disagreed with, uh, we took it seriously and we started looking at okay, what's what are the things that are most appreciated about what we do and what are some things that we can never or are, are less likely to overcome in human nature? Because we we think we're pretty good, but we're not good enough to overcome human nature, right? Human nature is undefeated. Yeah. So, you know, one of those was to institute um, some fairly passive long only exposure in our strategies. So first, get rid of the inverse stuff. Yeah. Because you are a hundred, I think it's fair to say, let's, I don't know if I can say a hundred, let's say 99% of the time, if you're short, you're going to have some really bad days because volatility begets volatility, it clusters. And as the market's moving down, it's going to you know move up by the same rate. And you're going to have some days where you underperform a lot, even if you're outperforming all around it. Yeah, and it's there's, really there's not a lot of dedicated short hedge funds still around. Good, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could have just known that and not done it to begin with. But, you know, we had to be, you know, go through the process and the pain of, of learning it in real time. So we 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 just realized that, OK, no more inverse. Now, 
we're not going to just become an you know asset allocation uh you know efficient market uh cap m type type shop and set you up with a 60 40 and then right just the model market. portfolio everybody yeah yeah i mean first of all you can you can get that for virtually nothing right and that's probably still overpriced so <laughs> we we took the stance of okay our first principle is to use to use trend following not only for uh, a potential risk reducer by avoiding large drops but also you know one that allows us to do that shift our allocation systematically so from that point the portfolios pretty much evolved from let's say 30 to 40 etfs down to about 15 hmm. and we started to do some research on okay what are these endowments like yale for example when david swenson was running yale they have unlimited resources, virtually unlimited resources. So what do they do? You know, just asking these questions, trying to think laterally and, and look laterally. And after reading a lot of their research in David Swinson's books, we realized that, you know, he set up a, a, a trust that effectively invests in the eight major asset classes in low cost ETFs. So when he passes on you know when he when he are you saying what do they do personally yeah 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 versus for the for the university yeah, yeah because i want to know you know what they do personally is what probably what they really believe and then everything else is pr and or what they can access with less than a billion dollars right yeah exactly so that was the next piece when we came up with this um you know construct of okay we want to have access. We want to have exposure to these eight asset classes, but we want to do it in a in a systematic way. The next question was, okay, well, how do they outperform? And you nailed it. They outperform because they can basically close a fund before it opens with an allocation, hmm. right? So, to the extent that the manager can generate alpha, and that's how they outperform through scale. Well, we didn't have that, so that's where the trend following piece comes in. So we feel like trend following gives us that edge, but it does so without a two and 20. Yeah. Um, a lot to unpack there. First, I want to ask what the eight asset classes are. Yeah. Not so to put you on the spot. If you know those off the top of your head. Hopefully I don't have a Rick Perry moment here. But... Yeah, exactly. One. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've got U.S. equities, foreign developed equities, emerging markets, real estate, then on the fixed income side, you've got, you know, uh, global fixed income, U.S. fixed income, and then alternatives. Okay. I didn't count them, but it sounded about around eight. The, uh, it's close enough. Yeah. And then, one. and then another piece of what you said was great. Where basically, you were providing a better sharp ratio or better MAR ratio to the clients and they had less drawdown, and more, but they're like, I can't eat a sharp ratio, right? Is the old line. So they were kind of saying, great, but I don't care, which I've always laughed at, right? If you do an efficient frontier, like, look, and I just got some unnamed mutual fund. I won't bring them up, but they their PR was your return went from like 8.4% to 8.45%. And your volatility went from like 6.8% to 6.6% .6 or something, wow. right? And your sharp jumped and I'm like, but still, who's going to move for that, right? Nobody's going to move off the, like, I'm going to sell 20%, put 20% into this alternatives mutual fund to get this 0.002% uh, gain. So those were some of those conversations like, great, but it's hard for me to understand and it's not really enough to move the needle. Yeah, and in, in, in inertia, every, yeah. especially in this business is, you know, you're... I guess if you're on the outside looking in, it's your worst enemy. And if you're on the inside, it's your best friend, right? Because movement is is less likely both ways. And do you think it was easier for you to come from that alts world down to that understanding versus it seems like the right most advisors doing the opposite, coming from the traditional model based up to trying to understand alts. So it's almost easier, it seems to me, to be like, cool, I understand the alts piece. Now I'm going to basically remove a bunch of those 
bells and whistles that people don't really care all that much about to incorporate into the traditional stuff. That's right on. I mean, for us, it was easier um, in everything but the marketing. I, I can come back to that. But starting from the more complex space and then, again, it, it's all about grieving your ego, you know, because we had the most, we, we tried to develop the most complex systems. Now we were keeping an eye on, you know, of course, you know, parameter sensitivity and, you know, all the stuff you're supposed to do as systems designers. But uh, when you compare what we do now to what we did then, I mean, it's night and day difference. Yes, it's based on trend following principles, but the implementation is nowhere near as complex now as it was then. So we have spent 15 years simplifying. Hmm. And some what of that confidence, you know, that, okay, no, all the physicists that say keep things simple, they're actually right. <laughs> you know, um, right, it's crazy to think all these billion dollar shops are getting more complex, more quanty, right? They're adding more AI and machine learning, all this stuff. And you're like, hey, time out, let's take it the other way. Yeah. And build a business, which is super cool. Um, it's like the old uh, creative, I'm going to forget the acronym, right? But there was like reverse, merge. There were all these things to do of like, okay, roller blades. Um, yeah. I, I won't remember all of them right now. But so, and then my third point on all that was, it seems in this journey, inherent in that is like, okay, I want to simplify. I need these couple of ETFs it almost creates the need for very specific ETFs to meet your needs, right? Of like, okay, oh, I'm having to pull these three out. If I had one that did what those three did, that would be great, right? Or if I had one that gave this unique type of exposure I'm missing, that would be great, uh, which is my segue into your partnership with Jerry Parker, well-known in the trend-following world, Chesapeake. Uh, so dig into that a little bit of, did that come out of that need for a specific type of strategy inside of the model? We definitely wanted it. Um, no question. It was uh, their idea. Um, but we have a an alternatives allocation in pretty much everything we do on the on the SMA side of of the of the asset management business. And we've used various funds. One of those was a uh, Chesapeake's mutual fund. We used that for a long time. But yeah, I think for us, it, it filled a need that we had, which was to include that ETF in, in, in our allocations um, and do so with a long track record uh, with Jerry at the helm. Um, you know, going back to something you mentioned earlier, which is, you know, the selection of the ETFs. And I, this, I promise it won't take long for me to dovetail these two ideas, but no we like index funds in that respect because uh, they're legally bound to have no tracking error. You know, I mean, they have to deliver. It doesn't mean we always like what they deliver, but they have to deliver what they say they're going to do. Right. So we will use index funds to express as much as we can from U.S. stocks or foreign stocks or emerging or real estate or what what have you. Uh, and you can do that at a very low cost, which is going back to the relationship between the advisor and the client, you know, usually a very easy conversation. To the extent we don't use something that's that we're actively managing, but it, it's passive, um, like this um, partnership with, with Chesapeake, we want to make sure that whoever we partner with or in the fund that we select, they're going to do what they say they're going to do, right? And you've heard Jerry say, or I've heard Jerry say many times, you know, I'm going to be the last guy. Like if trend following ever dies, I'm going to be the last guy on the ship. Yeah, he's he's going to be on, on top of the hill with the flag with the enemies all around him. Exactly. And I believe him when he says that. And um you know, not only his his the his opinion about things or his public messaging about them, but he he has a thirty year track record of of honoring that commitment. So that's really important for us because we do believe that look, if if you can get to a, a spot where you're comfortable implementing simple systems, then on the investment side, you're only 
job day to day, roughly, is implementing those systems over and over and over, right? So uh, Jerry systems are more complex than the ones we use at Blueprint by necessity to a large degree because they're using derivatives, you know, and, and we're not. But uh, I do trust that he's going to be disciplined. He does what he says he's going to do. Uh, he's got a lot of skin in the game and he has for years and just all of those things, not to mention they're great people, but yeah, we couldn't be more excited about that partnership. Uh, quick aside, have you heard, I, I keep hearing people say it does what it says on the tin, which I never heard that expression, but I guess that means like it tastes, it's a coffee tin. I don't get what it's trying to say. You know that expression? I, roughly. Roughly, right. I yeah. think, but I think he does what, what he says is on the tin. hundred percent. Yeah. If I, can, if I can butcher that a little bit. Um, cool. And we'll put in the show notes. We did a pod, we've done a couple podcasts with Jerry Parker and, uh, one a couple weeks ago that was talking about this new program that he's running. So we'll put that in the show notes for people to go listen to, but for you, that's just helped round out the portfolio, round out what you're doing. Each of your clients, do they get to pick and choose? They get to take their own lane or is most all inside this, right? Because that's got to be hard for an RA if you let every single client have unlimited, I want to be 90% in this, I want to be negative 20% in this. Like, how do you manage that process? If you said the client, the advisor are the most important, how do you keep them inside a a structure? It's a good, good question. Um, what we've done is we've designed a spectrum of strategies. And we, we are pretty agnostic to where they go on that spectrum. Now we do stuff off the spectrum, you know, one-offs occasionally, particularly for larger relationships, you know, institutional relationships will, will change some things up. But by and large, we have three different vectors, you know, to access the strategies. We call them strategic, dynamic, and tactical. And basically the portfolios look nearly identical. The speed in which the trend following shifts asset allocation is exactly the same. It's only the degree of how much trend following um, has over the allocation that changes. Hmm. So that by its name, the tactical strategies have, trend following has more influence over the tactical strategies than the strategic strategies, for example. Because, you know, our stance is we don't, the advisor has the relationship with the client and there's, you know, we'll help them develop suitability to try to get at, okay, a more accurate reading of where they should be on that continuum. But at the end of the day, uh, we let, we allow the advisor to choose where they need to go on that spectrum. But the goal being they're in the stay rich business instead of get rich business. For the most part, these clients or there's like, what's the appetite for growth versus protection? Yeah, good. So what we often see is, and again, as a general statement, yeah. if somebody's nearing retirement or in retirement, particularly if they're taking a distribution, they'll go for our more tactical strategies because that has the tighter, you know, the higher capital preservation stance. Um, if they're young- Which essentially means it'll get out of long equities quicker. So you're not waiting for a two-year drawdown to signal the trend, hey, we should lighten up on equities. And when we move, we move by more than the other strategy. So they, they not only do they, uh, they go defensive in, in the case of equities falling. So if the trend signals a downtrend, they'll all react at the same time, but the tactical strategies will move a lot more to the sideline. So that's a... You know, the tactical strategies, they don't necessarily have to be like this because we have a tactical growth strategy, for example, that um, when it's fully engaged with equities is if it's, you know, benchmark is an 80-20, it'll be more aggressive than an 80-20 because we have a brake pedal and the passive investment doesn't. Hmm. Um, but for someone that is their withdrawal rate is extremely important to them and it factors into their livelihood. They may go not only in a conservatively postured strategy, but one that has more tactics. 
Now, if they're in the accumulation phase and they're younger and they, they don't want the, uh, in some cases, the headwind of the risk management to, to kick in and behaviorally they can handle a little bit larger drawdown, they'll go into our more aggressive strategic strategies, which again, the same tactics, but they when they move, it's more around the edges. And then I've got a quant technical wonky question. So the trend following of the asset allocation is based on the stock market, right? Because, or I'll ask it a different way. Have you messed around with kind of trend following, trend following, right? And I've gotten into that with some, with Jerry and some others over the years of like, very hard to do, right? Because if you could avoid those, right? Everyone hates the extended drawdown periods and trend. Why can't you trend follow it and step aside on those? Um, it's pretty so, awful to trend follow a trend follower. Right. But yeah. but in a way, you're trying to kind of do the same thing. But you're saying, no, we're trying to trend follow the broad asset allocations. Yeah. So each of those eight asset classes is trend followed. Um, now, because of in our alternative allocation, because we allocate to a trend following ETF, that's held statically. And we allow the trend following to occur inside of that fund. Mm. But Perfect. anything yeah. that we hold passively, we are going to trend follow it. And we're going to use multiple timeframes to trend follow it to reduce our dependency and, you know, uh, change speeds, so to speak. And that so that's on the bonds, too. So has that been helpful over the last couple of years, right? Of, as bonds have nobody wanted to be in bonds, but you sort of had to be in bonds. Yeah, it's helped tremendously. I mean, we the gearing for our fixed income is pretty high on the duration scale because we like the hedging properties of, well, the historical hedging properties of yeah. government bonds relative to stocks. But again, you know, for us, it's about managing risk. So we're not just going to statically hold anything really. So we, starting in about, I don't know, August 21, what our, what occurs inside our model is, okay, we want to hold the default setting is longer duration bonds. But as we get a downtrend in those, we're just going to follow the yield curve down. As we get downtrends, we're just going to keep reducing duration, reducing duration. So we've been at, you know, less than a year duration for a long time, less than 30 days for probably as long. So wow. it's been very boring. Yeah. Uh, hey, boring is good. Yeah. That cash line item has been uh right the t-bill rate is pretty attractive these days no doubt so let's switch gears for a second and talk a little bit about you've been on all sides of this privates and what are the clients that you've come across feel about like private hedge funds and ctas versus etfs versus mutual funds um or are you saying they don't really care as long as they get what they want and there's easy conversation i think that people say that but they actually do care um, I think if it leaves their custodian, I think getting somebody to invest in, you know, a client to invest in something where the assets have to leave Schwab or TD or whatever is, is a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and look, private funds certainly can add value, but I think that the hurdle for that specifically for an advisor to recommend a private fund to a client where they may even lose the ability to fee on that. And I'm not saying that's a driver, but it's a practical reality. I mean, yeah. they, have, they have to take a look at this and say, okay, from a business perspective, I may spend five additional units of labor to move that, do all the paperwork, facilitate all of that, even facilitate transparency to the thing and reporting uh, to the private fund. Uh, they're going to look at that and say, okay, well, for, to your point earlier about the incremental return on the, that efficient frontier, you know, let's say, okay, I'm going to carve out 5% to go over here for what, you know, so the bar is super high. Yeah. They I'll put in a pitch for a team portfolio advisors, our company, which helps advisors do all that. I'm like, Hey, you can get access to the private fund at Schwab still shows above the line to get your fee on it. Uh, everyone's happy with electronic forms as well. So no paperwork, but um, yeah, but that was a bear to get done, right? Like years of work to get to that point where you can even figure that out. But so that's more advisor driven than client driven. It sounds like. So the client, right. Or clients like I must be an ETF or we'll switch a little bit of mutual funds versus ETFs. Are you seeing that 
fee pressure to clients only want the ETFs or is that advisor driven? I think it's still advisor driven. I think there are some clients that have an opinion, but I think all the client really wants is they want a, you know, we've actually noticed that clients have a, a little more, it's counterintuitive, but they have a little bit more reasonable expectations than advisors do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the clients want a reasonable return. Uh, you know, they're shooting for one that matches the goal in their financial plan, right? To meet their goals for how many every year's out to have the number they need to safely, that they feel will allow them to safely retire. So the implementation of, you know, the boots on the ground of what's actually in their account, as long as it remains fairly mainstream and not esoteric, I don't think many, at least the feedback we've gotten is that not many people care whether that's delivered through a mutual fund or an ETF. Not to mention most, at least in our experience, most 401k platforms are still in mutual fund form. Yeah. So how exactly. bad could they be if it's the only thing they could get? This is the thinking, at least. Um, some care about costs. Some advisors highlight costs more than others. So to those that do, an ETF portfolio is probably more appropriate. But I mean, you know, the data says if you're buying one total stock market index in an ETF form or a mutual fund form, the, the lines are just going to sit on top of each other with the only difference being the difference in the expense ratio. Uh, and then my next question will be for a specific listener I have for the podcast. So what about an interval mutual fund, right? Like a little different, this is getting into the weeds, but uh, allows you to do a lot more alternatives inside of it. The trade-off being you might not be able to get your money out for three to six months. Who who dislikes that the most? I'm glad you're asking me this and not our trading team. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe they would have a more entertaining answer. I think it's really, in our experience, um, the clients don't really know it's a, an interval fund mm. and they don't find out typically it's, sh it's a short vol trade for an advisor Yeah, because the client doesn't find out it's an interval fund until they want cash and can't get it. And then they have to have the conversation and explain it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and performance can, you know, put a salve on that that wound in to some respects. But typically, if you can't get your money out, it's not because things are going particularly well in yeah. that environment. You know, we've seen that in a lot of real estate interval funds. Um, you know, they're like, look, you can get uh, you know, sixty percent of your money back twenty percent of the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, all right, where you end up selling the thing over a two. <laughs> And I'm not challenging the efficacy of those funds and their strategies and whether they make money or not it has nothing to do with that. It's just, you know, a, a client's expectation, whether they're told this a thousand times or zero times is when I want my money, I can get it. And uh, it, it presents a unique set of constraints for the advisor. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of touched on all these different pieces of the RA business, clients, advisors. What's your view of the future, right? Are we, do we keep going the RA world? 20 years ago, right? They were stockbrokers and do we yeah. go full on? Is there no more fee-based? There are no more commission-based? There are no more mutual fund buyers uh, by advisors? Like what? what's your view of the future of the advisory space? Well, I, I hope that it's really good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. We do think about this a lot. I mean, I think it depends on your time frame for the future. Um, we'll say 10 years and then give me a hundred years. Yeah. You know, I think in, in 10 years, you are still going to see this migration from, I think, from the hybrid world over to the IA world. I think you're just going to see that for a lot of reasons. I don't think a lot's going to change other than that. Um, now you're going to see a lot of turnover in terms of, I mean, I think I saw a stat recently that 40% of financial advisors are going to retire in the next 10 years. So succession is going to be, is a huge deal. It's yeah. And a, a lot, a lot of the successful firms I know are, are 
right? Rolling up shops, bringing guys in that are going to retire, things of that nature versus getting new clients the yeah. old fashioned way. Yep. Yep. I mean, you're, you're seeing that in, you're seeing that show up in a lot of places. You know, the roll up strategy, you know, you're seeing valuations for firms go up. You've seen private equity enter in in a huge way over the past, you know, five or 10 years to, to fund those deals. Uh, and it makes sense because they look attractive. Um, and pro formas, they, you know, they look really attractive. Of course, every pro forma looks attractive um, at the outset. But I think in a hundred years, it it will look very different. I think some of that is going to be driven by, you know, uh, blockchain. I think some of it's going to be driven by AI in terms of how, how advice is delivered mm. and how it, digital advice is trusted. I think that's going to take a while, but I I think the the tools and the 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 software they they could probably be there largely now or within the next five years, but the adoption of that by, you know, I think about my dad going to some, you know, a chat GPT and, and getting financial advice is a joke. Yeah. There's no way he's going to do that. Um, and it doesn't, and it, there's nothing anybody can say that would cause him to trust that he wants a person to person interaction. Right. So, but right, I do many, think many young people these days, don't want like actually don't want the personal interaction they feel uncomfortable and they want it want it on the phone or want it in an email yeah i think two forces well one one major force i've noticed changes that behavior somewhat which is the the behavior around only wanting digital advice you know what recommendations guidance whatever and that's bear markets yeah right Bear markets, downside volatility causes things that happen in our nervous systems where you need a psychologist, right? Your your advisor job becomes psychologist. And I think it's half that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Or Even more, in the good times. Yeah. So I think bear markets, which most people, you know, let's say anybody that that had no money prior to 08 and now has money. 22 was a glimpse, but it, you know, it's not 08 or 01 or any of the past bear markets. Yeah. If they live through a, an environment where their passive ETF it's down 57%. Half, yeah. Exactly. I think betting on human nature in that respect means that that person to person advice and counseling and, you know, armchair being an armchair psychologist is unlikely to go away at any point. But it may become a more hybrid model where day to day, uh, an adv a human advisor relies on AI tools to help push out in a broader way guidance or advice, but is still available for for handholding. I don't mean that pejoratively. I just mean yeah, yeah. psychological piece. Well, and it seems versus ten or twenty years ago that we've already moved a lot towards that way, right? Of in the old days, the guy you golfed with and liked and trusted also picked out the investments. And it seems that, well, what's your opinion? Like what percent of advisors are still acting like that? Of they're actually doing the work and researching a stock and telling them to buy this and that versus, hey, I'm I'm the guy you trust, your golfing buddy, the guy you can call. I'm going to give you this psychological help, this non-pejorative handholding. Yeah. But all the heavy lifting is done by the investment team, which is smart and knows how to do that stuff. I'm a good golfer. I'm your buddy. Right. Yeah. So it's like. What percent do you think of RAs are the golf plus investment advice versus the golf and that's separate with the investment committee? I mean, there are a lot fewer firms now that put out their, put their uh, ability to pick stocks, at, you know, at the forefront. Yeah, yeah, on the masthead. Yeah, 10 years ago, it was probably 50-50 and now it's maybe 10, 15%. And you're seeing that not only in the data around outsourcing the investment piece, but I think one thing that's that a lot of people are paying attention to, a lot of advisors are paying to, attention to, is the fact that a lot of the data that, that shows that those that outsource the most grow the most in the advisory mm -hmm. world. So, you know, and you just think about that on a day to day, 
they they don't an advisor practically doesn't get paid any more or less for shoot, picking stocks or you know on a fee in a, on a fee basis. It's the preservation of the relationship. It's the service. It's anything from a surprise and delight, you know, gift or you know, round of golf or a pie, you know. Um, yeah, mm. to, that's some southern stuff there. I've never had an advisor give me a pie. Well, I know some advisors that that would absolutely would show up at your door with a pie around Thanksgiving. Done. I'm signing up. Yeah. Yeah. We had an advisor um, who's a, a, a great friend of mine build his practice. One of the things he used to build his practice was uh, delivering pies. And, you know, it says a lot about him. He's an entrepreneur and he, you know, he's just like, look, I've seen data in other industries that that really promote this being a good idea and he did it and it's a great idea. And he's got a firm that's, you know, 150 million now. Yeah. Uh, but it was based on stuff like that. And, you know, we manage money for his firm and it took him a year of biweekly coffees to be convinced of trend follow. Mm. And, you know, one of the reasons I love him is that he is skeptical, right? He challenges everything, but, uh, once he saw, okay, the data that, you know, everything he had, that maybe Warren Buffett is a little bit more trend following than people would like to believe, um, you know, just all of these, the tapes playing in, in his head of the things that he'd heard were right. Um, and I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying we think that, you know, trend following is just a more optimal approach in many ways. So, yeah, I think they it going back to advisors and and their ability to go to a client and say, okay, here's what we do really, really well. And here's why you want to do business with us. And by the way, we can't do everything top notch. So we've hired Blueprint or another firm to come along and we see them as part of our team. They're outsourced, but we see them as part of our team. So they're just as as available to you and to us as they would be if they were down the hall. You know, there's a lot of leverage in that relationship. And that's that's what we've experienced. Plus, you get some tasty pie. It, yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> I want someone, any listeners out there, I want pumpkin pie as we're coming into the season, but with a graham cracker crust. Has anyone ever tried that? That seems like it'd be a better idea. I hate, I love pumpkin pie. I hate the crust. And my second non sequitur is my brother is a realtor out in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And he, this time of year, loads up his truck with pumpkins and goes around to everyone who's bought a house from him or sold a house with him and says, hey, here's your pumpkin, right? How many you want? One, two, three? Because what, like, when you have little kids, that's great. You go out to the pumpkin patch. When you're older, I don't want to go lug those things home and set them up. <laughs> so go go deliver pumpkins or pies to get clients. I want to finish with what what's harder getting a RA client or getting a private fund CTA client since you've been on both sides of the fence. I would say it's by a factor of 50 getting a, a private fund client. It's <laughs> by a factor of 50. Really? <laughs> maybe more. Maybe more. And because of the structure, because of explaining the model, all of the above. Yes. The access, right. Yeah. Just go the the K one, right? Just go down the list. Exactly. I mean, all of those things. And again, you know, we loved running uh our private fund and we may do that again one day. So I'm not, you know, talking my book, so to speak, because most of the money we manage is in it, one of the major custodians. But yeah. It's so much easier to get, if you just think about an individual, to get an individual to, they likely already have a custodial account somewhere. So they've done it. Yeah. So it's not scary, right? They maintain control. Uh, you're adding something, an advisor is adding something to that relationship. When you're going to them with, hey, we have this thing over here and we need you to wire the money to this bank and sign this, you know, uh, tome of documents, right? I mean, it, 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 
and then you get in some cases you get daily daily you know reports but usually it's monthly and maybe it's quarterly and that doesn't even match up with the liquidity schedule of, mm. of a lot of funds anyway uh you can you know you you it's just it's night and day um as you mentioned the reporting there and my and you mentioned private equity earlier it, is private equity a part of your models no because it's a private fund doesn't fit well into there correct and then what are your thoughts on like cliff Asness and it's volatility laundering i don't know if you've seen any of that right but i just as a trend follower as a former cta like we have to mark the market every day the position the performance the client's seeing the performance every day like you said private equity figured out way better of like hey we're gonna tell you what this is worth maybe monthly but maybe quarterly and if it's really against us we're gonna mark to our model and just everyone's happy right and, and it's kind of like the yeah. investors the pensions the endowments they know it's not real but it keeps the volatility low they don't have these big drawdowns they're happy the managers are happy it's it's like a win-win yeah the the there in some cases i envy that right exactly yeah. That's I mean, <laughs> because it's i'm not saying it's easier but it, certainly your your day-to-day -day experience is easier well, it's uh, a it's a different way to do what you're saying of like help the investors uh behavior yeah protect them from themselves right like hey you're only going to see this infrequently and it when you see it it's typically going to go up i think if you it could ensure that there was a zero percent chance that the individual would need any liquidity for that pocket you know that bucket of of capital um for 10 years or whatever the term of that particular fund is because they're typically very long yeah. um it's probably well certainly behaviorally it's a better experience um and but you, actually doing that you know at, being able to say there's a zero percent chance that i'll, I'll yeah that's that's the trick yeah it, well and that's the underlying theme there and what cliff everyone's hammering on of like hey what if you're marking it but it keeps going down keeps going down and there's bankruptcies and then there's all of a sudden it's this and just like whoop all right we had to take a loss on that sorry all those past marks weren't weren't all that real yeah a lot of those you know i, I tend to look at things in terms of, a, of of their their profile um a lot of private equity i don't know what percentage but from what we've seen right because we get a window into a lot of this stuff when we're trying to help an advisor either convert a business uh or an advisor gets a big client in and they've got four LPs that they're trying to unwind or need, you know, advice on, we'll, we'll analyze it. They, a lot of them do have that short vol you know, option writing profile to them. Yeah. You know, you get the motion of, you know, the, the cliff and, and they, they look like that. And the answer can't be, well, just give it more time. But it, that happens to be the answer in almost every case where they they're stuck with an asset that they can't move or if they move it, they have to it to mark and then they admit to it being 80 percent of its value or, or whatever. So, you know, you can't get rid of the volatility. It's there. It's either under the surface or it's above the surface where you can see it and feel it. And I personally would rather have volatility, a little bit of volatility every day that I could that feel versus no volatility. And then the mother of all volatilities at some point in the future, I would just rather experience it day to day and, and, you know, learn to cope. Right. And so bringing it back to your models, right. If we're basically saying you can't right, volatility is transmuted. Is that the word? Right. You can't like destroy it. It's just going to move to different pockets. So when you're trend following these different asset classes, you're sort of destroying it, right? You're sort of getting out of the way when that volatility hits. But if we follow that theory, where is it Where is it going to in that example? Yeah, well, hopefully away from us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess, is... right. I guess volatility can't be removed. It just could be put to someone else. Like I, I'm getting it off my plate. It's on your plate now. That's right. And that risk, you know, that risk transfer is, you know, the... Um, uh, in some cases, I think it shows up, you know, theoretically at least as the economic rent by value investors to buy things that are are going down. Mm. Right. Yeah. So from an 
ecological perspective, you know, they should be rewarded for absorbing volatility from volatility sellers and their volatility buyers in that case. And trend followers inherently are going to do that when trends turn. Yeah. You know, just like there's some theories about trend following, particularly in the commodity markets are making money based on hedgers. Right. I think. Yeah. Non-economic activity. Right. Um, you know, willing buyers and or not unwilling buyers and, and sellers in some cases. But yeah, for us as trend followers, when we exit or reduce our exposure to U.S. equities, somebody's stepping up to buy that. And if you think about your your win rate, so to speak, I think that's part of and we we try to develop systems that are longer term in nature uh, for a lot of reasons. But the when we're selling and somebody else is buying, they're going to get rewarded more often than we are for doing that. But for every time they don't get rewarded, they get penalized by some factor. Right. So that's OK with us. Right. So that's the back to our they might have a higher sharp. They might have a higher total return, but they're taking on more risk to do so. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then you're you're not getting those bad calls, like you said. Uh, I'll leave it with you have Duke colors behind you. You said you're a Carolina fan, but you have that, right? It's kind of yeah, some dark blue, weird. black. I really don't appreciate you mentioning that, Jeff, but uh, <laughs> no, this is more of like a turquoise. Oh, okay. Maybe my, my camera's not picking it up. Then, yeah. Uh, this has been fun, John. What else? Anything else you want to leave people with? No. I mean, you can find more about Blueprint at blueprintip.com. Um, this has been fun. Like you mentioned at the beginning, you know, we haven't talked in in several years. I do listen to your podcast more than the ones that are just Jerry's on. So uh, <laughs> I, I enjoy what you're doing. I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, it's fun catching up. I'll look you up next time we're down that way. Do it. That'd be fun. Uh, definitely. And when you're back in Chicago ever. Yeah. Ditto. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Yep. Thank you. Okay, that's it for the show. Thanks to John. Thanks to Blueprint. Thanks to RCM for sponsoring. Thanks, Jeff Berger, for producing. We'll see you hopefully next week uh, working on a guest, if not the week after. Happy fall. See you soon. Peace. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCM Alts and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits. And listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors.